If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. to our program once again. I'm Larry Wessels with Christian Answers in studio with our Director of Research, Steve Morrison of Christian Answers. Great to have you here, Steve. Well, thank you, Larry. Uh, you we're already in show 17 in this series on early Christian church history. Uh, my, how history time flies. <laughs> but but as, as we've been explaining to our viewing audience through our, the, these vast amount of shows, uh, which makes the, the way the, the, the series is is going for so many shows, We this may take us into the 22nd century. <laughs> uh, we started filming in the 21st century, but we may not finish this till the 22nd century. Uh, but anyway, whether it's the 21st century or the 22nd century, the first century in the early Christian church history has a direct correlation to us over here on this side of, of uh, the, the, the millenniums in, a, in the back end because the early church is predicating their faith, the Christian church that is, on the Word of God, the Bible. So when we study the early Christian church, we get an idea of how those early believers who actually suffered persecution, death, uh, and many many times they were risking their lives even to believe this doctrine, this, this belief in the, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, which meant total commitment. So what we have when we look at the early church are some real true believers who uh, are willing to put their lives on the line for what they believe, and they're, attest they're testifying to the validity of the Bible, the Old Testament, New Testament. And uh, we, on this side, 21st century, are looking back at them, and we also have our Bible, the same one that they had. We also have manuscript evidence. We have archaeological evidence. We have prophecy evidence with hundreds of fulfilled thousands of fulfilled uh, Bible prophecies showing the supernatural uh, impact of the Word of God, that it's not just any old book, uh, but we have this church history also to go with all those other things, but besides just the testimony, which is, which is really key, the testimony of the, the power of the Holy Spirit from a, the, the, the divine action of God himself to uh, confirm our faith in Jesus, which has to be done in as I've said many times, uh, you must be born again, John 3, 3 through 8. And, but we combine all these things to really have confidence that our faith is on solid ground. Our, our faith is, is on a rock, and that rock is Jesus Christ. It's not the Pope, as Roman Catholics would tell you from Matthew 16. Our faith is predicated and built on right, Christ, the rock. He is our rock and our faith and our foundation, and we trust him. And uh, what I, I go on preaching on this subject, subject for a long time, but we've still got quite a bit of material to, to cover, and I want to get into that. Now, we finished the last show uh, dealing with uh, biblical evangelism and talking about evangelism. And uh, at the end of the last show, Steve was defining four attributes of evangelism that you find in early church writers. I'm going to have a recap that and then get right on to what, what we see exactly from the early Christian church writers. So Steve, take it away. Okay, well four styles of evangelism that people do today and the early church back did all four back then are charismatic, irenic, apologetic, and polemic. And charismatic from like kerygma is like the preaching or encouraging or inspirational kind of evangelism. Irenic we come from the root Irene for peaceful. It is more like a, a peaceful discussion, Bible study, things like that. Apologetic is defending the faith, showing why Christianity is right or why other Christians are, are wrong. And you might think of it more of an intellectual way of doing things. And polemic is more of a harsher and a rebuke. It's like, well, you already know the truth and you're not following it. 
and, um, and, and sort of an encouragement in a negative sense to leave where they are and, and to come to Christ. And the early church did all four, and we're going to see exactly uh, what they did as they transformed the world in the, th in the 300 or so years, you know, up to, up to uh, 325 A.D. for what they did for evangelism. And some things we're going to see are kind of uh, quaint, some things are um, kind of curious, and some things are actually pretty good we might consider doing today. <laughs> so and anyway, for the charismatic and our reading styles of evangelism, they were preaching the gospel to others. At least 11 writers talked about that. I have 11 here. There are probably more. The bold proclamation of truth. Not saying if this is true, then this, or, or possibly consider this, but bold statements of that. And we need to not forget of boldness in evangelism. Seven writers talked about that. Quoting God's word to unbelievers. The word of God you know, is living and sharp than a two-edged sword, and we should use that when we talk to them. Eight, eight, at least eight writers did that. That's Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, by the way. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> um, and then sharing of personal testimonies. Um, at least 15 writers shared their own personal testimony or the personal testimony of another Christian in, in talking with people. Creative allegories or, or metaphors. This is kind of a fun one. There are at least 26 writers that had some interesting illustrations, and they're, they're kind of neat. And it's like, you know, it's fine to, have, to make up illustrations that will be for that culture that like, of a person we're talking to and, and, and sharing with them. Quoting poetry to share truth. We probably don't do that too often today. I don't know how often you do that. I, uh, I, I've never been a poet or anything. I do get a newsletter about once a month or every couple of months from some Christian guy out there that... Uh, Sends me a newsletter, and he has always starts it out okay. with a little poem about Christ. All right. Well, that guy might be at home in the early church then. Uh, <laughs> it sounds like Clement of Alexandria did write poetry, but a lot of them quoted Greek poetry that would show some truths, you know, that they were in the Bible or something like that. Homer was actually one of their, their favorite ones to quote. Hmm. A promise of heaven or, or God's love. Just sharing, okay, you, you know, this is what the goal is. 23 writers talked about that. Threats of hell, or God's wrath, if you don't believe, at least 12 writers talked about that. Okay? Also, the fact that mortal life is fleeting, or very short, and that compared to eternity, the life we live on earth is just nothing, practically. Several writers kind of emphasize that, as do Isaiah in chapter 40 and James 1, you know, 10 through 11. The martyr's blood, not the people get martyred, but specifically the people's martyr is a testimony for God, sort of a witness of blood. Uh, 12 writers talk specifically about that. All right, a use of a katina. Now, a katina is like three or more Bible verses, like one right after or shortly after the other, and kind of using those verses combined to make a point. Uh, that's actually 25 writers use katinas. So it's like when you're d disputing with somebody, especially maybe in a cult who maybe has some respect for the Bible, you might use this to, uh, to, to show your point. So, so, so use, using scripture with that. And then the, the idea that many Greeks look back to Homer. Homer was one of the earliest Greek poets. And just reminding them that, hey, Moses is a lot older than Homer. And if someone were to claim today that, oh, the, you know, the Bible is copied from Greek stuff, it's like, well, I don't know, you would I believe this, but you can make a stronger case that the Greek stuff could have been copied from the Bible because you can't copy you know, earlier stuff from later stuff. You can only copy later, later, for, later from earlier. And actually, I don't think either one was copied from each, mm -hmm. but if you're going to say one's copied from the other, you've got to go through Moses, who's earlier. Mm -hmm. Okay? So give you some examples of a creative analogy. Clement of Rome uh, gives the example of the phoenix bird, which he believed was a real bird, in Arabia that every thousand years would make a big fire and would throw itself in the fire and die. And then it would be re-resurrected as a new phoenix bird and live for another thousand years. And then repeat the process. And he uh, gave that resurrection as saying, well, if phoenix were going to be resurrected, well, then Christ is resurrected. So God gave us an analogy in, in nature, which is all nice and good, except phoenix birds don't really exist. <laughs> it, uh, another one, uh, Lactanius, uh, says that when Christ stretched forth his hands on the cross, you know, like he stretched them out, it's like he measured out the world, and even then he might show that a great multitude was about to come under his wings. Well, that's kind of a beautiful poetic imagery there to, to share stuff. Uh, Theophilus of Antioch, he quoted the Sibyl, and, and there are different Sibyls, but the Sibyls were these uh, Greek and, and Roman uh, female poets, and to show that there was some truth there, so that he said even Greek thought contained the idea of a, of a, Greek, of a supreme God. And that is true. I mean, Greek thought actually had a lot of contradictory things, and in some of the Greek thought there was an idea of one supreme God. And he 
part of the Greek prose nods and they contradict himself. Okay. So they, they, they did stuff like Christians should do today on charismatic evangelism, Irene evangelism with the Katinas and everything else. Let's move on and see what they did for defending the faith and apologetic evangelism. They would patiently answer the questions of others, as Jesus did. Seven writers at least would do that. They would use questions themselves to kind of like point out the inconsistencies and contradictions in what others believed. And they, at least 33 writers, did that. Uh, both in talking to pagans and talking to Martianists and other Gnostics and things like that. And uh, besides using questions, they would show the misconceptions people have about Christianity or contradictions about their own view. Uh, 17 writers did that. And they would use verses of the Bible like they would... One of their favorites was Psalm 110. You know, where the Lord said to my Lord. Jesus used this in Matthew 22, 44. This is also used in, in Acts 1, 34, 35. You know, who could be this other Lord here? One Lord and another Lord. And show how to refer to Christ. Well, 15 early church writers echoed that. You know, using that verse, especially in the context of talking to Jewish people, to show how, who is this other Lord? There really is no explanation unless it's the Messiah. Okay? Now, number five, I'm kind of getting the more philosophical and scientific proofs here. Uh, how nature witnesses to God, like in Psalm 119, seven writers talked about that. A6, they would appeal to science to show that there was a God, both versus atheism and both versus paganism. Now, if you think about paganism, in a sense, there's a similarity between paganism and atheism. Paganism believes in all these little gods, but they don't have a whole lot to say about who's the one cause of everything. You know, all these little gods are more powerful than us, but they're all fighting and doing their own thing too. But saying, no, there has to be one creator. Mm -hmm. And so they would use science. I have to tell you, sometimes though, they got the science a little wrong. And we'll talk about that later. The other thing, that they would use a, what today we call the cosmological argument to say with all these things here, every caused event has to have a cause. And if there is a beginning, there has to be a first cause. And that first cause is God. And, f and four writers use that argument. And this is you know, prior to Nicaea, uh, a long time ago. All right, uh, no another argument they use is there's only one that can be supreme. And six writers use that. There's only one. You know, instead of worshiping all these little guys around here, worship the highest God. Okay? The other thing, they appeal to historians for the show the truthfulness of the Old Testament or the truthfulness of various things. And there are uh, some Greek historians around, Herodotus and, and, and stuff that, that we have, their works. There are other historians that we only know by name, but they knew a lot of historians and, and, and appeal to those. You know, Barosus, the Chaldean, things like that. Are you saying that the early church fathers felt that it was a useful thing to, you, to study history? Sec secular history, right. To study, study things in the past for the validity of their own beliefs. Right, and they, and they were no slouches at all when it came to knowing their history, knowing about philosophy, and knowing about other religions. We're going to get to what they knew about other, other religions a, a little bit later. Uh, but, but they were um, uh, pretty highly educated, actually. Uh, the, the other thing that they stressed a lot, that maybe you don't hear so much today, is they stressed the morality of Christianity versus the morality of other religions. If you compare Christianity to the Greco-Roman religions, Actually, that's a pretty easy thing to do. <laughs> you know, some guy goes and kills people, gets mad, gets revenge, loses his temper, commits a, 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 adultery. And you want your kids to learn about that God so they can grow up and emulate him and, and admire him, you know. But then on the other hand, you know, with one religion that has, you know, probably at least 800 million adherents, uh, Hinduism, a lot of their gods in the Hindu mythology did the same thing. You know, Krishna would, would have these uh, trice, you, you know, where he would be bathing with these gopis and... And even women married to their husbands would want to go out and see him. And it's like, well, you really want to respect that guy? You know, uh, so some of the things they did, you know, we put a guy like that in jail maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, they, were, they were quick to, to bring that up. And just to give you some examples, uh, for the first cause, Athanasius, who wrote a lot after Nicaea and was very prominent in Nicaea, but we're only, for the purposes of this study, we're only using the things that he wrote prior to Nicaea. In 318 A.D., he says that some, such as Epicureans, wrongly think that everything had its purpose in itself. Others, such as Plato, wrongly think that God is a mechanic who could only make things out of pre-existing matter. However, God created the matter too, for God made all things and he made it out of nothing. And this is from his work, The Incarnation of the Word, uh, chapter 2, page 36 and 37. So it says implied here, because he didn't actually say, use a term such as first cause, but he showed that you know God had to make everything out of nothing. 
okay, uh, for A, that only one can be supreme, uh, Theophilus of Antioch, he refers to the Sibyl, and he quotes some poetry to show that, that even Greek thought said there's only one supreme God. So th they did a fair amount in, in apologetics. We're going to go back later and look at some more stuff. But let's look at, at some of the polemic met evangelistic methods that they use. They use debate and argument in witnessing. With all this Gnostic stuff, you say, well, why don't they just sit down and just have a big debate about it? Well, just to one Christian to debate one Gnostic probably wouldn't be the best because you had so many different kinds of Gnostics. So there actually was a debate written down with one Christian named Adamantius debating two different Gnostics. So it was really like a three-way debate, and, and they debated each other, too. Um, this is about 300 A.D. We also have a debate with uh, Archelaus debating a, a heretic named Manus earlier than that. So they used debate and argument a lot, and they and the Greeks and Romans, they were skilled in rhetoric and debate. Um, the non-Christians were, and the Christians were too. So 22 writers wrote about that. Uh, the other thing about don't throw your pearls before swine, which if someone is just not willing to listen to the truth at all, then at some point you say, well, there's no point in teaching them if they're going to reject, you know, A, you know, one point, then there's no point in trying to teach them of things after that if, if they can't even get past the first point. But, but the idea in Matthew 7, 6 of quoting that and saying, don't put, throw your pearls before swine, eight writers referred to that. Also, calling others' beliefs delusions. Not you're mistaken, you have a few small errors here, but you're believing a delusion. <laughs> or, or you guys have delusions. Uh, ten writers talked about that. So they, they would call a spade a spade mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and say what it was. Well, Jesus himself did that in John chapter 4, I believe it was around verse 24, at the woman at the well. He basically just told her, look, you have this religion and you know not what you worship. Yeah. <laughs> he just basically said, you're out here worshiping, but you don't you even know what you're worshiping. Yeah. Right, right. So right. Jesus himself gave you the example. But anyway, yeah. go ahead. Okay, but also another thing is apologetic use of Plato's uh, Timaeus. Plato's work, the Timaeus, uh, emphasizes more about one God and he even says there, there's one and there's a, another crossing him, almost like a big T, or Tau actually. And, and they would say that's almost an a, um, analogy before Christ that, that might, you know, lead people to consider, you know, that there could be only one God, and yet the God could, you know, be Father and, and Son at least, you know, and, 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 and using a cross. So seven writers use that illustration. I don't know any Christians who use that today, but then again, should they? You know, we live in a different culture. We might be using, um, you know, a, other popular movies or books and stuff and relating those to the gospel. Well, early Christians did the same with Plato's Timaeus. Not that they ever hinted that it was scripture, but they used it in a positive sense to say there's a little bit of truth here that we can use as a bridge. Okay? Uh, an another thing, which kind of um, maybe clears up a mystery a lot of people have about the Bible, is six writers had apologetics use of Jupiter's tomb. Now this is a really interesting one. Because there were a poet, actually there were, there were two poets, who said Cretans are liars. And Paul mentions that in Titus 1. Well, why would you say that about Cretans for? Or, or about, about anybody else? Well, the reason the Greek poets said that is because the Cretans said that Jupiter came from Crete. And we can show you because his tomb is here where he was buried. And they said, well, wait a second, Jupiter is a god. He's up on the Mount Olympus now. He's not dead, so he's not buried, so the Cretans must be liars. So this was an intrinsic contradiction uh, within the, 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 the Greek mythology that how could he be buried there if, if, if he uh, was that way. So they had the tomb and they would honor him in his tomb and they had all, had all this stuff and everything else. And so uh, when Paul just touched on that Greek poet quoting him saying Cretans are liars, they would know the rest of the, uh, 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 of the context of that because they're liars. They said, so did Jupiter have a tomb that people are venerating or did he not have a tomb? And they're all very foolish to venerate somebody that, 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 that's not there. Also, pointing out the adulteries of the Greek gods, it's like, well, why would you follow guys like this? You know, you know you're going to worship these guys that you want, don't want near your wife. Is that right? <laughs> Ten writers pointed that out. He, uh, humor and witnessing. Paul used a little kind of um, not uh, belittling humor in saying, well, I wish all men were like me, except for my bonds. Mm -hmm. But uh, and early Christians used humor, too. Some of it was kind of belittling uh, of others. Uh, but they went beyond that and had harsh rebuke in witnessing too, like Jesus in Matthew 23. Uh, they, they were very harsh to say, you know, you criticize us for doing these things, which we don't really do, and yet you read God do the same thing, and, 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 and you criticize that? No, you stupid guys worship them. <laughs> and they use name-calling. 
and you know, seven writers use that, and they had ridicule and sarcasm in, in, in witnessing, and some of it is um, kind of dripping in sarcasm, actually. It's kind of like the, the pagans already knew sort of the contradictions was wrong, and they were just driving the point home, you know, fairly harshly, actually. Well, a big time sarcasm is the very reference you have here on the chart, First Kings 18, with the Elijah at Mark, Mount Carmel, yeah. where he's just chastising those uh, false prophets of uh, Baal, uh, basically saying, what, what's wrong? How come your God's not showing up here? You're doing all this stuff, and where's your God? What is he? Has he gone out to the bathroom or something? Right. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 and some modern translations soften that, or paraphrases and say, has he turned aside? But basically, the, he's saying, has your God gone to the bathroom? So was the early church very gentle in their witnessing, or was the very church very harsh in their witnessing, or was it in between? And the, answer, the correct answer is, after reading all of this stuff, is all of the above. Uh, depending upon the circumstance. And so we shouldn't limit our evangelistic method. We shouldn't uh, criticize an evangelistic method that Jesus used, or, or, or Paul, or, 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 or the, uh, we shouldn't criticize any evangelistic t method used in the Bible. And most of these, not all, like maybe Timaeus, but most of these uh, are in the Bible. Okay, so I'll just give a couple examples of, of, of H5, of Jupiter's tomb. Origin, 225 to 254 AD, he answers, Celsus was a pagan, who wrote a work against Christians, and he answers their charge that they, the pagans, worship Jupiter, who has a tomb in Crete. And so Celsus said, we worship a guy who has a tomb, and he criticized Christians because he says Christ has no tomb. And Origen points out that Callimachus asks which one lied, when some say Jupiter was born in Crete, and some say he was born in Arcadia. This is an Origen against Celsus, book 3, chapter 43, page 41. In H9, Victorinus, a bishop of Petau in Austria, he was martyred 304 AD, he calls heretics of the school of Satan and says this is what we gladly know by scripture. In commentary on the Apocalypse, Apocalypse is another word for Revelation, chapter 218, page 347. So, you know, sometimes you do need to call people, you're of the school of Satan, okay? So, they would refute the different heretical groups and what are the groups that they know about? Uh, well, they refute the Ebionites or Judaizers which may be mentioned a little bit in Colossians 2, or maybe alluded to, uh, you know, maybe in Galatians, the people that Paul talked against might have gradually evolved into, into Judaizers and, and Ebionites. And eight writers talked about that. Uh, Simon Magus, they wrote a lot about him. Uh, after Peter rebuked him in Acts, he went on and became even more of a heretic, and he found this prostitute named Helen that he uh, later said was a divine being, and he was a divine being, and his purpose was to find her and save her, and so those, those two went out and started their own religion, and several writers wrote about that. And then uh, from Marcion, many heresies came from him, Marcion of Pontus, the Gnostics kind of exploded when, when he wrote about that, around 170 AD, and 14 writers wrote about him. And there are different kinds of Gnostics. There were the Valentinian Gnostics, that uh, 17 writers wrote about them, and they were kind of like saying, well, because we're spiritual people, we can kind of uh, do what we want. They were uh, called Libertine Gnostics. There are also Sethians or Ophites, which are other kinds of Gnostics, and there were Encretite Gnostics, that started with Tatian. Eight writers wrote about them, and there were other kinds of Gnostics too, and they kind of covered the whole gamut of all the Gnostics. But in R8, to kind of sum things up, they would not believe in mixing Christ and any other religion. Like there was one Gnostic, Justin, for example, he talked about how Elohim sent Apollo to earth, and then he sent Hercules to earth, and then he sent Jesus to earth. And another Gnostic group, they basically took one of the myths of Hercules and they applied it to the Bible. And so they tried to, you know, you fit in other gods in Greek mythology, well, you just fit in Christ in there too, and you call it a Gnostic group. Um, so they would do that. They avoid Docetism in R9, uh, that Jesus, Docetism says, Jesus didn't really suffer in the flesh. Maybe Jesus wasn't really a man, wasn't really here in the flesh. He just appeared to suffer. He kind of fooled us that he suffered. And they disputed against Sabellians. Uh, Thirteen writers said that, that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are indistinguishable. So you could say, you know, did, did, did the Father suffer on the cross? You know, did the Spirit suffer on the cross? No. Uh, it, it's only Jesus Christ that suffered on the cross. Mm-hmm. And notice these writers are writing against Gnostics and these other religions and things of that nature. So many people try to mix it all together. Well, there's no mixing with Christ. Mm -hmm. There's a set gospel that's exclusive of all these other things. And, and this is why the early church fought against all those heretics. Because there is an exclusivity to the gospel of Christ, and you can't just believe anything you want. 
Now, with that, join us again next time. Where uh, if you have any questions, want to email us, call, or write, check out our websites, biblequery.com, uh, historyquery.org. Oh, that's right, biblequery.org, uh, uh, historycart.com. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll be glad to help you out. We got a newsletter if you like, get on the mailing list, uh, free of charge. All right, with that, I'm Larry Wessels with Steve Morrison uh, with Christian Answers. Join us again next time, and may the Lord bless you. God bless. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 